Thank you, Aaron. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you guys for joining. Um, absolutely a great introduction, um, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you guys some tips and security measures uh, to making work from home effective and secure. Uh, before I get started, I do want to just uh, upfront say uh, I am going to cough through this presentation. Uh, I do not have coronavirus. I have been tested, uh, but it is allergy season, and with uh, the amount of rain, pollen, and the, everything else outside uh, just does a reek of it, and I did uh, lawn work on Tuesday when it was nice out before the rainstorms yesterday, so my apologies in, the, in advance of the coughing. So, a little bit about TechWise Group. Uh, TechWise Group uh, was founded in 2011 as a Microsoft cloud-focused partner offering comprehensive technology support services. 100% uh, of our customers are using Microsoft cloud technologies for at least one of their workload, and we've successfully moved over 500 companies into the cloud, uh, be it email, be it uh, Microsoft Azure with the servers. Uh, TechWise Group is a Microsoft gold partner, um, so we are definitely uh, experts in Microsoft, I like to say. Um, just, you know, a little bit there about me. Uh, the big thing, uh, I have contributed with articles to the Patriot News, Penn Live, uh, Fox 43, uh, MSP Insights is a, is a magazine that's uh, for the tech industry. MSP stands for Managed Services Provider. Um, you can contact me, email scott at techwisegroup.com or on Twitter at Scott R. Davis uh, are two easy ways. Everything else was kind of covered in the intro. <coughs> so our adventure today, we're going to kind of go through five tiers. Uh, the evolving office, you know, why are we here? You know, what got us here? Security training and why it's more critical today than ever before. The home office that is designed for you. Uh, yet secure enough for your operation or your organization. Uh, what comes next? Um, you know, is it going to be a light switch, you know, where, you know, all of a sudden, you know, the light switch is flipped and everyone's back in the corporate environment. Um, and then tips to improving your home security for work. Uh, and I threw some added bonus in today. Uh, if you're not aware, it is actually World Password Day. And so I threw some password tips as long uh, to end the presentation on that with some bonus stuff. So the new normal, uh, Barclay CEO Jess Staley said that putting thousands of workers in a corporate office building may never happen again. Well, why is that? Well, the corporate office has changed. Uh, with the forced work from home mandates from COVID-19 coronavirus, uh, you see you know, organizations of all sizes have had success with the remote workforce. Uh, they're seeing their employ employees can be trusted working from home. Uh, in some cases, in some of the research that I'm seeing, there's actually more productivity coming because there's the flexibility of, you know, getting up, you know, no drive into the office, so there's no frustration of traffic, you know, you're refreshed, you get into work, you take breaks through the day as needed. You also see uh, an interesting trend, you know, I've seen is people are actually putting in more time than they even realize it because there is the you know, no more time commuting. Uh, there's, you know, less distractions at home. Uh, so, well, there can be distractions at home depending on your home life, but uh, there is actually some studies that show a higher productivity with your workers working from home. <clears throat> you also then have lower costs with remote workers. Uh, and over time, you'll be able to move into smaller office spaces. Uh, one of the things TechWise Group uh, has recently done uh, is we've moved into a smaller office space before the whole coronavirus COVID piece, just because we've embraced the work from home methodology and the uh, etiquette. Uh, the big thing driving it is the technology is already here. The technology was ready for it. The technology was waiting for something. Uh, and, you know, these forced mandates of work from home really opened the door for the technology to shine. Now, if you follow the news, it hasn't all been pretty. Uh, there's been a number of instances with security lapses. Uh, Zoom is one that got a lot of media uh, publication about some of the security issues that they've gone through. But anytime you have an application or a program in technology that goes 
and grows, you know, tenfold overnight, you're going to have security concerns come out of the woodwork. Um, and, you know, your, your user base has just, you know, magnified that. So what is the driving technology? Uh, virtual meeting tools, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, Google Meet, you know, those are three of the big players. You have Facebook and there's a lot of others that are getting into the game, uh, but your big ones, Microsoft Teams and Zoom. Uh, Google Meet just went free uh, before Google Meet was only available for users that were using the Google paid environment, but Google Meet is now free. Collaboration tools, uh, Microsoft Teams and Slack. Uh, collaboration is how you communicate uh, when you're not sitting face to face or you can't just get up from your desk and walk over uh, and have a conversation with someone. Uh, Microsoft Teams and Slack allow that in a chat based interface, um, you know, for the fun things, you know, like sharing memes to, you know, serious work conversations to even group conversations when you have to get multiple people involved. Over the last years, uh, last couple years, there's been a drive into these cloud hosted servers uh, where if your server's coming up kind of end of life and you're a smaller organization with one server, it may be more affordable for you to move that server infrastructure into the cloud with Microsoft Azure or Amazon AWS than it is to purchase new hardware and run the server out of your office. Uh, technology has really opened the door and uh, has allowed this type of thing to happen. Uh, another big thing is just the overall internet speeds have increased. I mean, it's not weird now to say you have a gigabit internet connection at your home through Comcast or Verizon Fios, and most offices have kept up with that trend as well. <coughs> You also see a trend towards hosted applications, and this goes back even further than the cloud hosted servers, but QuickBooks Online is one example. You know, you go back 10 years, the only way you could run QuickBooks was running QuickBooks on your local desktop. Well, now there's that web-based version, QuickBooks Online, and many major applications across every industry is moving to that kind of online hosted application instead of that one-time purchase, you download it, you have it, um, that hosted you know, application, you're paying a monthly fee, but you're always getting all the latest updates, it's updated for you, less downtime, you know, and just everything on the, along the lines. So into security training, you know, the end user is your weakest link. To secure your organization and meet today's compliance requirements and laws, every organization is required to provide ongoing cybersecurity training and staff. Uh, and I say that because if you process credit cards, PCI DSS actually has a section that requires cybersecurity training. Um, if you're doing work uh, in the state of New York, the New York State Shield Act uh, requires cybersecurity training for your staff. If you're doing work in Massachusetts, theirs. Uh, if you're doing work with the DOD, their guidelines require it. A FERC, NERC require. I mean, there's a list of compliances that go on and on, uh, but chances are the basics. If you're processing credit cards, PCI DSS, you know, in one way, shape, or form, you need to provide uh, cybersecurity training. So what should your training program look like? Uh, it should utilize a learning management system, uh, an LMS. It should be annual and quarterly training. Now, every organization that I work with does training differently. Some of them, it's in-person training where I've gone out on site and I sit down with the eight employees and I go over, you know, these are, you know, the trends in cybersecurity. These are the things kind of to watch out for. It takes 30 to 45 minutes, you know, and everyone kind of leaves. But in a lot of organizations, getting everyone together at the same time becomes a challenge. And that's where the learning management system comes into play because you can actually track who completes it, when they completed it, and then automatically schedule for the next year's training to take place. So annual quarterly training modules, annual and quarterly. Uh, the quarterlies are refreshers. They should be 10 to 15 minutes that the user just get a quick refresher and move on. Uh, include games, posters, challenges, videos, quiz. It's not all just sitting there and watching somebody talk for 30 minutes. You know, they're interactive. They've, you know, really have advanced in the overall capability of these systems. Um, and some of them even include simulated phishing or vishing. Uh, phishing is that email that comes across that looks like coming from um, the World Health Organization on, you know, the latest COVID update. 
Um, but it really is someone just trying to get your information. Uh, vishing is the same thing as email, but it's actually done via a phone call. <coughs> uh, the most common of that is the uh, couple of years ago, it was all rampant. It was, you know, hi, this is Microsoft support. Uh, we're detecting an issue with your computer. We need to remote into it uh, and kind of going through the process until they get your credit card. So I wanted to throw an example of one of the coronavirus phishing emails. Uh, since COVID-19 coronavirus, uh, phishing emails have just magnified multiple, multiple times over. Uh, and there's been a lot of success with coronavirus phishing emails. And it's, I think, one of the main reasons that simulating phishing emails and cybersecurity training is taking a whole new magnification to what organizations should be doing. But here, you know, here it's coming from who-pc.com. Uh, it has coronavirus. Um, you know, there's an attachment, you know, click here. Um, a lot of them, it's, uh, you know, it's a link to a web page. Um, and it looks legitimate, but it takes you to a phishing page trying to get you to put your credentials in for, you know, Office 365 or another online service. Um, I've seen just phishing emails as a whole. Um, They've just magnified. Um, yesterday, I read an article of 28 um, healthcare organizations in the United States that have been breached since the beginning of 2020. And of those 28, 22 of those organizations on the list, the breaches were email related breaches where a person using a phishing email got a username and password and they set up a mail forwarding rule that for anything that contain, you know, social security number or account information or the word billing, it would actually forward it to this random Gmail account that was monitored. Um, and for healthcare, you know, they were monitoring, you know, different things and they got social security numbers, they got health records, they got all sorts of information just out of email, uh, which is a whole different conversation. Don't transmit uh, PII, personal identifiable information over email unencrypted. Um, but that's a whole different story and a whole different episode. Uh, know Before is one of the best products out there. Um, TechWise Group is a partner of Know Before, but so are a lot of other IT companies out there. Uh, you can also sign up for Know Before directly through their service. Uh, you can go to knowbefore.com. I did put a link that takes you right to a free phishing security test where you can actually test up to 100 users uh, within your organization. It takes maybe 15 to 30 minutes to kind of set up that base and get that phishing email set up. Um, but you can use bit.ly-3fp1fuv um, and it will take you to that. Uh, and I can post that link in the chat or provide it to anybody that wants it outside of here. Uh, that gives you that free phishing security test. Uh, I highly recommend doing it. It's going to give you an idea of how your users are interacting with it. Uh, right now, the ones that I do for clients or potential people uh, is all coronavirus-based, COVID-based. And every single one of them, I'm getting a 60 to 80%. Um, I call it a, a success rate for the phishing, uh, but it's really a failure because users are clicking and providing information. So your home office, that's really why everybody's here, uh, is your home office has transitioned overnight from not just a home, but now it's a shared office space. Uh, I work from home, my wife is working from home. We have a child that's in daycare that's sitting at home. Uh, we have two children that are school age that are you know doing fifth grade work from home. Uh, it's also a restaurant because you can't go eat at a restaurant. So it is pretty much your home has transitioned to pretty much everything. So finding that effective and secure way to work from home is absolutely a challenge. <coughs> so let's start with your home internet. So your home internet could be slower than at work. Um, if your organization requires you to connect over a VPN, it can actually slow it down more. On average, connecting over a VPN to an organization reduces the internet speed by about half. So if you have a 
500 meg internet connection and you connect over VPN, your threshold gets down to about 250 megs. Now, using the examples of 500 meg and above, you really aren't going to see any issues with you know servers because that's still a good internet connection. But when you talk now, you know streaming services, uh, you know one of the kids finished schoolwork, they're watching Disney Plus or Netflix. Uh, you got, you know, another kid in a Zoom meeting for school, then you're in a Zoom meeting, uh, my wife's in a, in a, you know, Zoom meeting, you know, your bandwidth can get eaten up pretty quick. Um, home internet's also not as secure as the office. Um, IT departments in the office go through great lengths to put firewalls in place, put enterprise grade switches in place that have security functionality. They have security services, they have content filtering. So there's all these security services that are built into your work network that when you leave the office and go home or go to Starbucks or go uh, to the McDonald's Wi-Fi or the airport Wi-Fi, you lose all that security. Um, also at your home, you have hidden internet of thing risks. Uh, almost every home anymore has at least one device that's Internet of Things. That could be your thermostat that connects. It could be light bulbs. Uh, there's uh, fridges and freezers and stoves and ovens that all can connect to your home Wi-Fi network. Uh, those are all risks. Uh, and if they're on the same network as the network that you're using for just the overall work network, you know, those are all at risk. Um, one of the most popular IoT um, uh, hacks, I'm going to say, is there was a uh, Las Vegas casino had, you know, a giant fish tank and they had a Wi-Fi thermometer to monitor the temperature of the water. <coughs> a hacker actually hacked the thermometer and used the thermometer to gain access to the hacker's network or not to, not to the uh, casino's network. Uh, it's, you know, really one of the biggest breaches in IoT, uh, but any device that's on your network can be breached, can be hacked. Um, it's just finding someone that has the energy, the time, the commitment to go through the process to, you know, go through it. But IoT risks are there, um, and that's why a lot of organizations recommend connecting to that VPN, because then they can kind of encrypt and, you know, control the, some of the behavior that you're doing at home. Work versus personal devices. Your work computer should be only used for work. Personal computers, you know, should be used for personal stuff, not for work. Um, you should use a software VPN when possible to connect to your office. I highly recommend using a VPN. Uh, and don't share your work computer. Um, in some households, I understand, you know, it can be a challenge trying to juggle, you know, all of a sudden you got kids at home trying to do stuff and, you know, people, you know, sharing computers here and there. Um, but do your best, you know, work should provide you a computer to work from home if they're requiring you to work from home. Um, but, you know, try to make that computer the work computer um, and don't share it with others in the household. Your workspace. Um, you should have a designated work area. Um, get an office chair. Think ergonomics. Um, I mean, sitting at the coffee, sitting at the kitchen table, uh, you know, it may be comfortable when you sit at the table for, you know, 30 minutes to an hour for dinner, but it, when you try to sit in, you know, your dining room table for eight hours a day, if you have just wooden chairs, no padding, you know, the table is typically higher than your desk or where your keyboard should be, so your ergonomics are going to be off, um, but think just overall about your workspace. Um, <coughs> Make a designated area that you can work. Um, I know in some houses that's harder or easier said than done, but try to get that designated work area. Try to get an office chair. Think those ergonomics. And then obviously don't leave printouts open. Don't leave, you know, company data just laying around. Um, you know, it may look like a fun chart, uh, but it could have your sales projections on. Your kid may think it, you know, is a piece of paper that they can write and draw on, and it's the only copy you have. Um, lock the computer when you're not at the computer. The last thing you want is, you know, a kid to walk up and, you know, go to Nickelodeon.com, type it in wrong, and, you know, get a different website. 
Um, so just lock your computer, you know, think really the same measures that, you know, should be instilled on you from working at the office, the things you should do when you leave your desk, um, really should be the same principles at home. Maintain a routine. So I think this was the hardest thing. When I transitioned to working in an office to working at home, I think finding that routine was the hardest thing. I was like, oh, I'm working from home now. I can, you know, every day at lunch, I'm going to go run three miles and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Well, none of that built a good routine. Um, you know, get dressed, you know, even pants. I know a lot of webinars out there, uh, you know, people get dressed up from the waist up uh, and they keep their pajama pants and uh, comfy shoes on, but get dressed, you know, you're going to work for the day um, and be prepared for it and do your best to keep a schedule. Uh, so I have a schedule. Uh, it's my Outlook calendar. I have four breaks built in a day that force me to get up from the, from my, you know, my office environment, either walk outside or it's typically I'm taking the dog out and playing with the dog for a little bit. Um, but try to keep a schedule for work. And then also when work ends for the day, have work end. Uh, with you working from home, you know, more people are more apt to, well, I just have to finish this one more Excel document. I just have to finish this one more thing. Working from home, you can find a trend that you are putting more energy into work and less time into family, or, you know, it can go the other way around where, you know, you're not an effective scheduler and everything you're doing is just the personal stuff that needs done around the house, but try to keep a schedule. So you know when, you know, you're working and you know when you're not working. Um, and ultimately sharing that in that outlook type environment, it lets everybody in your organization know that, Hey, Scott's walking the dog every day at 10 30, one o'clock and three 30. So, you know, I know for five to 10 minutes, you know, he's not going to be at his computer. Um, but try to maintain a routine because, you know, it's the same thing. You know, you wake up, you get showered, you get dressed, you drive to work, you, you know, you do X, Y, Z. Hey, it's, I wake up, I get showered, I get dressed, I eat breakfast, I walk downstairs to my office. Company data, um, try to limit what you're downloading and storing on your local machine. Uh, don't put anything on USB drives. Uh, data breaches happen daily, uh, and it can even happen while you're at home. So reporting a data breach is an absolute nightmare. Uh, and I hope none of you in this conversation with me today or that are watching this uh, after the fact have to report a data breach. But data breaches have become so complex that you really need a dedicated team working on it. Uh, when you have a data breach, you have to look at you know, the residencies of everybody that's affected by the data breach. So you have to know what data was breached. Then you have to go to the states that have, what states have information that was breached. And each state has different breach notification requirements on when you have to notify, who you have to notify, and when. Uh, so you have to understand all the different states that are impacted. Then you have to look at your compliant, your industry compliances from PCI DSS to HIPAA, uh, FERC, NERC, uh, et cetera, and understanding what their requirements are and who and when you have to notify. So it easily becomes just a tremendous headache of, you know, reporting a data breach. <coughs> I also like to bring up almost every variant of ransomware that's being used today has a component built into the ransomware that's actually exporting data from your organization to the group behind the ransomware. Um, the Maze ransomware group, I think, is the most popular right now because right now, if you get Maze ransomware, uh, if you don't pay the ransom within 48 hours, they post the data uh, or they begin posting the data that they've compromised from your environment or stolen from your organization, they begin posting it online until you pay them the ransom to get them to stop posting your data. Um, and just because they stop posting it doesn't mean they don't still have the data. Uh, just because you pay the ransom doesn't mean you're actually getting your data, the, the unencryption key. Uh, so ransom has tremendously evolved and there's a lot of things that we have to do to make sure we're protecting data um, and ultimately going through breaches. Uh, I really see 2020 being a pivotal moment with laws, 
and compliance requirements. And it's really going to be the year of the breach um, because there's going to be so many breaches and so many people even not reporting the breaches because they don't know that the data was taken because you have no controls of information indicating what was breached. Um, and it isn't all like that. Company data breaches happen. Uh, you know, if you have your laptop left in your car and someone breaks into your car and steals the laptop, you know, if that computer you can't prove was encrypted and the, there wasn't a post-it note under the battery with the username and password, you know, there's a potential that data is now breached. Uh, and in a lot of states, it's a breachable, you know, process that has to go through. So, you know, when you're working on company data at home, make sure you're protecting the company data the same way as if you're sitting in the office. <coughs> so what does tomorrow bring? As the stay-at-home orders are lifted, you know, don't just assume that your office is going to be ready for you the next day. IT departments, IT vendors have spent weeks optimizing your network for work at home. And it may take some time to reverse that optimization. So, you know, think of it, you know, not just your IT department, but uh, your cable provider, your internet provider. You know, they've moved bandwidth that, you know, typically is running to your organizations and moved it more into residential neighborhoods because the bandwidth trend has, you know, changed so much from, you know, commercial to residential. So really work with your IT department and formulate kind of what a plan looks like of bringing your team back into the office. You know, document it, um, you know, coordinate with your IT. What I really recommend is treating it as you're moving offices, because really you are. You moved offices when you went from the office to work from home, but you're really moving offices again when everyone's bringing all their stuff back into the office. I recommend you know, finding a way to stage it, bring certain people back in certain timeframes. Uh, you're also going to see some people are going to consider keeping and maintaining some people that are more mobile, that can work from home as this has proven that they can. <coughs> and that brings in you know, this modern workplace. And that's really where we are today, where some users just have proven that they work better from home. And, as a business owner, as an organization, we should embrace that and we should let them. Um, a lot of times, you know, users that are working from home, they're happier because, you know, they see it as they have more flexibility. You know, now it's proven it can work. Uh, I think the biggest challenge IT companies face is how are you going to secure it? Um, because, you know, as I've gone through here, you know, we've talked, you know, phishing, we've talked cybersecurity training, you know, we're talking, you know, breaches, you know, all this scary stuff. Um, it's really up to the IT team, your IT department, your IT vendor to make sure that the money that you're putting into protecting your data is going into the right places. Uh, just having antivirus and a firewall is not enough anymore. And there, I kind of said, you know, cybersecurity training. There are a lot of modern security tools out there. Um, Huntress Labs is uh, a couple year old company based out of Maryland. Uh, and they're doing some tremendous things with, you know, artificial intelligence, you know, analyzing how your computer normally uh, operates. And then if there's a change in that normal behavior, it raises a red flag and says, guys, this is unusual. Um, file folder logging. Most organizations don't have anything in place that does this. Um, it's actually required for a number of compliances uh, from ISO 27001-2. Um, HIPAA requires it. Uh, and then your SOC uh, certification, if you're, you know, SOC compliant requires it. But what file folder logging does is it actually can tell you who accessed what files and when they accessed it. So if, you know, you did get a ransomware variant, it's going to show you every file that was accessed that was potentially taken off the network. Uh, the more information you have in kind of the investigation after, a, you know, an incident takes place, the more accurate you can be with what was breached instead of just guessing and assuming everything was breached and you have to notify everybody. Um, for the last, you know, 18, two, 18 months to two years, you know, I've talked to clients and customers about multi-factor authentication, two-factor authentication. Anymore, it's a must. 
uh, it's included with Microsoft Office 365. Uh, it's included with, you know, your social media, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, you know, they all have, you know, 2FA or MFA functionality. In today's, today's world, it really should be required for your services. Um, it's not as bad as it sounds. Um, you have typically an app on your smartphone that gives you a random six digit code. It changes and it matches a six digit code on the back end. Um, and typically once you log in with it, that, that two FA maintains on that computer for a period of time. So it's not every time you're signing in, you have to do it. Um, now if you're an administrator level and you're trying to make an administrative change, it probably is going to prompt you for that administrative change just as an added security precaution. But now is the time really for your IT departments, your IT vendors, your IT teams to start enabling 2FA MFA. Um, Microsoft did a study, uh, you know, they're finding, you know, upwards of 99% of organizations that enable MFA 2FA uh, aren't getting hit with the same sorts of breaches and uh, attacks as companies that don't have it. Um, so I have no idea how they came up with 99%, uh, cause in my experience, most organizations don't have, you know, 2FA, MFA enabled, but you know, once you have MFA, 2FA enabled, the attacks that are hitting and are being successful with those that don't have it, 99% of the time it's blocking them. So really look at that 2FA, MFA piece. I don't think I can stress it anymore. So tips and tricks, um, you know, just in case you missed them as we were going through the presentation, you know, what are the best tips and tricks to working from home? <coughs> One, don't have allergies because when you go grocery shopping and you cough, everyone assumes you have coronavirus. Uh, two, maintain regular hours, create that routine, create that schedule, have a dedicated workspace. Make to-do lists, know what the items you need to accomplish and when you need to accomplish them. Take short breaks through the day. Uh, avoid social media. Social media can be a pitfall. You get into one Facebook video, next thing you know, three hours have gone by and you've watched 30 episodes of Paul and Stars or something. Uh, check in with your team frequently. Have meetings scheduled throughout the day with different team members and just talk to them. Um, you know, hey, how you doing? Um, there's some things that you can do for team exercises over Zoom. Uh, we did a scavenger hunt the other day where we came up with a list of 10 items that are common in households. And it was kind of a, we started the meeting, we gave the list right in the meeting and the first person that came back got a gift card uh, for, um, it was uh, one of the restaurants that's doing delivery or, um, geez, I don't even remember the app. It was DoorDash. Um, so, you know, there's different things that you can do kind of to keep the energy up and encourage people to come back. Um, and it was funny seeing some of the spatulas people brought back uh, <laughs> as they were going through and showing. It's like, wow, <laughs> uh, stretch regularly. Um, you know, it's the same thing, you know, sitting in a chair that's not really designed for an office environment or that is designed for home use, not really an office, you know, make sure you're getting up and stretching. Uh, more on the tech side, use multi-factor authentication. <coughs> Collaborate securely with Microsoft Teams uh, and 365. Uh, only use your work computer for work purposes. Secure your data uh, by only working on sensitive data when you're connected to the VPN. Uh, I recommend resetting your home Wi-Fi password. Um, and the reason I recommend that is really before coronavirus and COVID, 19, when someone came to your house, it wasn't atypical for them to ask for your Wi-Fi password to connect their phone or connect, you know, a tablet. Um, and depending when the last time you changed your home Wi-Fi password was, it probably is a good time to reset it, update that password, uh, because there could be a lot of people that have it. Uh, I also put a recommendation out when everything started uh, for actually organizations to disable their office Wi-Fi. Your office Wi-Fi, if it's still turned on, it's typically accessible from the parking lot. So if your Wi-Fi is on in the office and no one is going to your office, you could have somebody sitting outside your network uh, that, you know, it could be an ex-employee that has the Wi-Fi password, could actually be sitting outside your building, connected to your Wi-Fi, 
uh, and doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Use a software VPN to connect to the office. Uh, look at, implement complete cybersecurity training. Um, and I put question every email because really with the amount of phishing emails that are coming around right now, really we should be questioning every single email. You know, is it actually from the person that says it's from? Is it from here? You know, does this match? Does the link actually take me to Microsoft.com or is it something else? And like I said, when I started, um, you know, it is World Password Day. So I wanted to kind of go over some password tips and tricks, um, or at least uh, the National Institute of Standards of Techno and Technology, NIST, uh, is a government organization and kind of what their recommendations are. NIST is a good place to look at what their recommendations are for different things with technology, mainly because a lot of compliances like PCI DSS, uh, HIPAA, they actually get things from NIST to make changes in their policies. So length is critical. Uh, I think everybody here probably has an eight digit password or an eight character password uh, for their work environment. I think the big thing that's recently changed is password length has been changed. Uh, it's actually required for NIST compliance to be up to 64 characters. So talk about a long password. <coughs> Your system must accept passwords with special characters. This includes now emojis and spaces. Uh, typically in most systems, spaces and emojis wouldn't count as a password kind of figure. Uh, but in the new standards uh, from NIST, it actually wants you to accept these passwords even with emojis and spaces. Prohibit the use of sequential or repeating characters or even dictionary words. You know, don't, don't allow someone to have the password 1111111 or A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Um, you know, no sequential, no repeating characters, uh, no A, 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 or things like that. Uh, and then dictionary words. Uh, some of the most common passwords that are breached, you know, things like password or spring 2020. Um, these are common things that are used in so many organizations. Um, you know, really, you should do your best to prohibit them. Um, password hints like knowledge-based authentication questions are actually no longer permitted. Uh, so they have been banned from the compliance requirements of NIST. Um, that's the, you know, what's your mother's maiden name? What school did you go to? Things like that, really, we need to do away with. Um, the main reason is every survey that you do on social media that asks you, you know, those 10 questions, they're all used to help create the picture of what your password is. And the amount of people that still fill those little surveys out thinking they're fun little games and it's sharing information, well, that's exactly what you're doing. You're sharing information. So password hints like the uh, KBAs, you know, should, should be removed from your systems. This is an interesting one, uh, removing the periodic password changes and forced complexity requirements. So really for the last, wow, what, 10 years, you know, it's always been, you know, change your password every 90 days, change your password every 90 days. It has to meet complexity requirements. Well, NIST has finally recognized the fact that the only thing those two policies have created is less secure passwords. Um, so NIST standards actually recommends now removing of those policies and allowing people to create easier passwords, but longer passwords or more complex passwords. Uh, when you're creating a password for a system and you type something in and you think it's secure enough and it keeps coming back and saying it's not, it drives you frustration to the point that all you're doing is adding numbers and exclamation points at the end until it meets the criteria. Uh, and then you're probably going to forget it. Require screening of new passwords. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a newer thing and a lot of the newer systems are doing this. Uh, Microsoft 365 uh, has recently introduced it as well, but it screens all new passwords against a commonly used list of you know, those dictionary words, but also list of commonly compromised passwords. Um, in Office 365, it also can give you the capability of you know creating your own custom directory um, and it automatically pulls things in like your company name and city of where your business is located so there's a lot of things you know with that but require screening of new passwords 
I think the biggest thing is using a password manager. Um, there's a lot of them out there on the market um, that kind of do it, but use a password manager and try to use different passwords for everything. I know it sounds annoying and it's frustrating, um, but try to use kind of a different password for at least your core things. You know, your banking account should be a separate password than your work accounts. Your work accounts should be different than your social media. Your social media should be different between Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, you know, there was a uh, learning management system uh, that was breached um, and roughly, tw I think it was 22 million users and their uh, hashed passwords and encrypted password was breached in that. Um, but a lot of the results in that 22 million uh, users was corporate accounts. So if your corporate account is the same password for your computer and you use for everything within the environment, now the people that hack that now have your username, your name, the information about your organization that, you know, was in this program. And now they can go through the process and starting trying to either unhash the password to get it to clear text or go through the process of, you know, trying to uh, place phishing attacks, spear phishing, directed phishing attacks towards you to try to learn more and ultimately get into your environment. Um, use different passwords for different things. So that's kind of the bonus that I wanted to put in here today. Um, you know, at this point, I want to open up to some questions. I, I like different quotes. This is one of my favorites. You know, there's no such thing as an unreasonable question or a silly question or a frivolous question or a waste of time question. It's your life and you've got to get these answers. That was Marsha Wallace, American actress. Uh, if you don't have any questions now, and, but you want to ask some questions, by all means, you know, shoot me an email, scott at techwisegroup.com. I'll help you out as much as I can. Uh, but uh, Aaron, uh, do we have any questions? Can you hear me? Oh, there you are. Okay, sorry, I was still muted. Um, first question is from me. How secure are the auto-generated passwords that Google and WordPress and other sites will create for you? Um, so randomly generated passwords are more secure because A, they are randomly generated. Uh, but even the metrics and the algorithms that go into creating those randomly generated passwords are not created equal. Um, you know, is it just giving you uppercase and lowercase uh, letters? Is it throwing numbers in? Is it putting symbols in? Uh, how long is the, is the password? Um, you know, when anywhere that I'm using, you know, a randomly generated password, I'm using at least 14 characters. Uh, I'm putting it into my password manager, which has a plugin that, you know, helps me put it into the web browser. Um, so, you know, they're not all created equal. Um, it is more secure than using the same password for everything. Awesome, thank you. Um, and we had an ask from Heather if you could post the link to the site you're referring to about password day, the NISC slash NISP. Um, the, the NIST, the NIST guidelines or? Yes, I believe that's what she was referring to. Uh, I believe if you just go to Google, it's NIST 800-171 is the guidelines that outline password compliance. Um, and another question I had is, considering how many scams there are out there right now, like it seems like scammers are in overtime with COVID-19 and, you know, some of them are healthcare related, some of them are tax related, like there's a lot of scams that could capture with people being vulnerable right now, what are just ways that you can figure out, especially because we're somehow getting communication from every business ever that we didn't even know we signed up for. So how do we know when it's a scam and when it's just a business trying to stay in contact? Um, there, there's red flags. Um, look at the address that it's coming from and identify that. You know, is it someone that you're expecting an email from, an attachment from? Um, you know, and look at that. If it's an attachment and it's an Excel and it looks somewhat legit and you open it, if it asks you to enable macros, uh, immediately say no, close it. Uh, that email is phishing. It is, you know, potentially a virus or malware that's, you know, potentially in the process of getting onto your system. 
if you see that from an email attachment where it's asking you to enable macros, uh, immediately get on the phone with your IT department uh, so they can make sure that a breach didn't occur. Um, but look at the sender. Um, I used to say, you know, we used to be able to say that you can look at spelling. Um, you know, there was once a time that these fishers were horrible spellers. Well, they've discovered spell check. Um, so they're actually pretty good at it. Uh, they also pretty much copy templates. <coughs> if you've never signed up for CNN news bulletins and you get a CNN news bulletin email, that should be a red flag. It's, you know, is this something that you typically receive an email? Uh, then anything that has a link uh, that has a you know mouse over it and it's going to tell you what the address is. And if it's not CNN.com, if it's not WHO.org, if it's not TechWiseGroup.com, then you know the person that's sending you the email could be compromised. Uh, one of the uh, more popular um, phishing uh, tools that are out there right now that you can buy and people can run uh, or hackers typically buy and run, um, actually go in and they send phishing emails. And once it gets a password, it logs into the Microsoft Office 365 environment. And it actually is uploading a malware package into your OneDrive package. And then it's sending an email out to your recently sent people with a link to that OneDrive document. So it's sending you know a link to a legit Microsoft source, uh, your, your space. Um, or your company, your space within your company's Office 365 environment. Um, so your uh, antivirus isn't picking it up because the email doesn't contain anything that's negative. Um, then it just comes down to identifying, you know, is this expected? You know, is this something that I would expect from this person? And if you're not sure, the best thing to do, walk over to the person's desk or pick up the phone and call. Awesome. Did anyone else have any other questions for Scott? And of course, his email is on the screen. So if you do have a direct follow up or think of something later, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer questions later. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, it's been great. I hope you uh, learned something out of it. Uh, if you do have any questions, like uh, Aaron just said, please feel free to shoot me 